Shepherd Honolulu and welcome. This is uh, today, it's Sunday, August the 30th. And this is a special day for us as we come together and gather around God's Word because it's a special day, uh, especially if you're wondering what does it mean to be a Christian? And how is it that we're supposed to uh, walk or live as Christians? And so today is a very insightful day for those who maybe are on the journey of life, uh, searching for life everlasting and where you can find it and when you do, how it is that we are to live each and every day until we reach our heavenly home. So the Lord be with you and let's begin with some opening verses. They come from the Psalm, Psalm number 37. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as a light, and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way over the man who carries out evil devices. Delight yourself in the Lord. And so open your mind now to uh, a rather uh, unique story of the prophet Jeremiah. Here was a man who had a calling, a very unique burden, that he was to uh, tell the people of the future of God's plans. God was going to bring judgment, but in love, he was going to carry his people away from their home and in the future only then bring them back to rejoice in his love and in his presence. And so these words are the cry of the prophet Jeremiah. And as you hear them, think about times when the burdens that God has given to you maybe feel sort of heavy, uh, overwhelming, difficult, impossible. Will find uh, great hope in uh, joining with Jeremiah in trusting in the promises of God. The Old Testament reading for today is from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 15, beginning at verse 15. O Lord, you know, remember me, and visit me, and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, take me not away. Know that for your sake, I bear reproach. Your words were found, and I ate them. Kind of a strange way of uh, consuming the promises of God. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. I do not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone, because your hand was upon me. For you have filled me with indignation. Rather strange gift from God, isn't it? Fed up with the ways of evil men. Why is my pain unceasing, my wounds incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail? Uh, even the best of the prophets wonder sometime how long the heaviness that they shall bear. But therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you want utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them. And I will make you to the people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail. 
save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Open your heart to the strength and comfort that comes uh, from one of the songs that comes from the scriptures. Psalm number 26. It reminds us, uh, as the songwriter writes these words, that when life starts to feel like it's closing in on us, we might even feel like our enemies are putting us in a pinch. 
we can uh, call out, maybe even sing a song to the Lord, and be reminded of the amazing strength and grace that God provides to his children. The psalm for today is Psalm 26. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. And I have trusted in the Lord without compromise, without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving out loud, aloud, and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are evil devices, and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity, redeem me, and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly, I will bless the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Before we get to the gospel reading for today, we cannot help but appreciate uh, the psalm that we just heard. A song was written by a man who knew that God's command that his people should gather to worship. Oh, how I long to be in the house of the Lord. Because when God's people gather together for worship, he blesses them with a special presence. Something that you can't get at home, you can't get at the beach, you can't get at your favorite restaurant. But God's people, when they come to the house of the Lord, are richly blessed. And so what a joy it is to be together in God's house this morning with uh, family and friends. And especially uh, inviting others online to come and uh, be a part of this time. It's not quite the same when you stay home, say, and watch something on TV or just listen on the radio or maybe even connect on the Internet. But there is blessing for God's people when they gather. And so they hear stories like this that comes from the gospel reading for today, the gospel of Matthew the 16th chapter, starting at the 21st verse. Now, we need to appreciate this is sort of a running story. Last week, we caught the first part of the story where Peter finally got it right and confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so I want you to think, to see if you think Peter really has it clear in his mind as you hear how the story continues. We're with Jesus and the disciples. They're uh, about the farthest away they could be from the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus asks them the question, who do you say that I am? And think about the answer that God even asks of you. And what difference would it make if you would say, no, thank you? Or say, yes. I am willing to carry my cross. The Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. 
And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And so we begin our message this morning. The message of the day is, and here's the title, Stay on Highway 8 Forever. Stay on Highway 8 Forever. Now I have to admit that at times... Uh, Family and friends have forewarned me not to be too clever when it comes to preaching the gospel or providing instruction in God's truth. Uh, but I happen to think I got a nice clever doozy for you this morning with this one to remind you based upon the word of God and upon Jesus. Forever stay on Highway 8. You know, we've been uh, journeying together trying to find our way, especially during these challenging and most difficult times. I know a lot of folks are feeling a little bit hemmed in and are wondering about the future. And so we've been in a series called Hang On to Hope. And what we're discovering here, especially in the midsection of the Gospel of Matthew, is the story about Jesus Christ and how he shows himself as the Son of God and the Son of Man. And he then wants to teach his followers how it is that they can live, not just survive a pandemic, an, ep, uh, uh, an economic crisis, uh, threats of opposition, or even a threat for life. He actually shows them the joyful thrill of how it is that we can follow in the footsteps of Jesus until we reach our final destiny. And so this morning we want to learn a little clever little thought that I came up with and I share with you how to stay on Highway 8. Now many of us, if you have traveled around the country, maybe even around the island, you have uh, been on a journey to navigate your way, making sure that you're on the right road at the right time, Otherwise, you may end up on a dead-end street. These followers of Jesus, as well as the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes and the religious leaders, even the crowds and the multitudes, kept, at least in their mind, focusing their hope and their comfort upon the arrival of a Messiah that would take care of everything that they needed, of course, their way, their needs. Along comes Jesus, and he begins to tell stories, perform miracles, teach lessons, that he wants people to know that he is Israel's Messiah. He is the man, the anointed one that the Old Testament prophets 
foretold that would be coming. But when he came, so many wondered what he would look like and how he would act, how uh, he would perform his ministry and his service, not only to God, but on behalf of humanity. And so we've reached a part in the story where after a good chunk of time, weeks, months, these disciples have finally been able to confess, I know that Jesus is the Son of Man. He is the Messiah. But as we see in the story for today, they didn't quite have the right picture of how Jesus was going to do his job, how he was going to fulfill his calling, and really what it meant to be the Son of Man, who would be the King, who would come and dwell among us, suffer, die, and on the third day, be raised to life. So I got to thinking about this little episode, and uh, what helped me with this clever little idea of how to stay on Highway 8 is I was introduced to a riddle, you know, a, a little puzzle, you might say, for your mind to figure out. And here's the riddle. If you are traveling on Main Street, how can you meet your friend on the corner of Main Street and Main Street? That's right. If you travel by walking or maybe riding your bike or for that matter drive your car, how can you travel so that you can meet your friend who has let you know that he is standing on the corner of uh, Main Street and uh, Main Street? Well, the answer to this riddle is by following Highway number eight. Main Street in the riddle happened to be one street that was put together and shaped like the number eight if you were looking down from a helicopter. So you could see there is your friend standing on the corner of Main and Main. And if you want to get to him, all you have to do is follow that movement that takes you around like the letter eight. That's how you'll meet your friend. That's how you can meet him at the, sec, uh, the intersection of Maine and Maine. Now, the reason why I think this little riddle and the answer helps us today is because Jesus is about to bring the riddle out in the open. Not only who is he, but how is he going to perform his responsibilities and his mission and ministry as the Messiah? We learn from the story that is told and recorded for us by that tax collector, reformed follower of Jesus, Matthew, that he tells us the story that actually becomes kind of the pinnacle point, the shift, the pivot, you might say, in the whole story of the Gospel of Matthew. Because Matthew records how Jesus talks about not only the cross, but actually mentions in the story two crosses. One cross is for the Christ, and the other cross is for you. Now maybe we are familiar with the cross of Christ, but uh, Peter certainly wasn't. He wanted to stand his ground And imagine that Simon Peter, the skilled fisherman, is rebuking the Son of God and trying to tell Jesus what to do and what not to do. Well, Jesus goes on to explain, Peter, your grandiose idea, whatever it may be, is not the plans and the will of God. In fact, any plan that opposes the will of God is probably a plan that comes from the evil one, Satan himself. So Jesus barks out and says, Satan, get behind me. What you're saying to me, uh, Peter, is a lie. For he goes on to explain 
that he now is going to pivot and turn his attention to his task of going to Jerusalem, being turned over into the hands of sinful men, be falsely tried and accused, sentenced to death, nailed to a cross, die, and on the third day be raised from the dead. For Jesus, there was a cross that was before him in order for him to be God's son, the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world, for him to be the suffering servant, the long and awaited and promised Messiah who would give his life as a willing sacrifice for the sins of Israel and the sins of the world. Friends, let's face it. It's why many Christian churches insist on gathering together in the presence of God with the emblem of a cross to remind them of Jesus his purpose, his plan, his success, and his glorious victory through a cross. But no longer is Jesus dead in a grave. He is alive and well and seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, I find it rather interesting that Jesus on this occasion begins to take the story even further as he makes his pivot. For quite a while, he's been trying to teach his disciples what it means to follow by faith the Son of God, the Son of Man. What it means not only to know Jesus for who he is and what he came to do and what he will forever be, but also to learn how to take first those baby steps in walking and following Jesus. And so Jesus turns to his disciples, Peter and all the other, and begins to talk to them, no longer about his cross that awaits for him in Jerusalem, but their cross that awaits for them when they choose to take their steps in love, in devotion, with faith, to follow Jesus. Now, Jesus sort of did it in three uh, kind of picture point, freeze the frame kind of phrases. Deny yourself might be considered the first step. Take up your cross might be considered a second step. And then continue to follow and follow and follow me. Many Christians like to put a cross in their car. They put one on their refrigerator. Sometimes they have a t-shirt or two or three or maybe even wear a cross around their neck. Does that cross mean that you have willingly denied yourself Laid aside your own ego, your own ways, in favor of picking up the cross, the work and words of Jesus Christ, which alone the Bible says is the power of God unto salvation for all who would believe, and for those who wish to walk with boldness of faith, they walk by way of a cross, by the way of sacrifice and serving to impact the world. Does that cross mean that much to you? Well, Jesus said, follow me. That is his invitation not only to the nation of Israel, but also to all the Gentiles. It is an invitation that is beaming all around the world and whether it's when we gather as a Christian community for church 
or whether we gather in our homes or whether we find ourselves working day by day or perhaps enjoying the leisure of retirement, the invitation that Jesus gives to each and every one, follow me. So to help us out this morning, I'd like to suggest that here's maybe the easiest way for us to keep following Jesus. Just stay on Highway 8. Again, you remember the letter or the number 8, it makes this uh, wonderful, continuous, it almost looks to be an infinity loop as you go round and round and round the number 8. Many people today feel like they're going around in circles with life. They can't seem to find a final destiny. They're not sure what mission or what goal or objectives they might have. And they just feel like they're going around and around in circles, causing a sense of uh, insanity. Others are kind of uh, taking a different route. They're going down the proverbial dead-end street. They think they have it all figured out. They got all of their ducks in order, and then they begin their journey only to find that they have managed to walk, ride the bike, drive the car, down the alley of their own thoughts and ideas. And they have reached a a dead end. Has COVID-19 created the dead end for you? uh, Economic crisis for you? Anxiety and relational tension skyrocketing in our world? Is that your dead end street well why not get on the highway highway number eight with christ because when you think about it you can see that the well the number eight it goes around but it always comes there in the middle to the cross where we can be reminded that on a cross jesus died for our sins He took the penalty, he took the harassment, he took the interrogation, he took the insults, even the lies that are hurled against you. And they were nailed to the cross of Christ with the hands and feet of Jesus. If you stay on Highway 8 and you keep going round and round, you will always come to the cross of Christ. But also, you notice that when you go around and you make your turns and you come to, again, the center of uh, Highway 8, you come to the intersection of, uh, well, Main Street and Main Street. They happen to be the same street, but they've made an intersection. So remember, when Jesus picked up his cross and carried it, and suffered and died upon a cross for the sins of the world and for your sins and mine. We are reminded at the intersection that at the crossroad, at the intersection, Jesus calls you to pick up your cross, pick up your burden, pick up by faith the calling to follow in the footsteps of Jesus in a life of sacrifice and service. Because no other life will impact this world. Sacrifice and service is what we find at the intersection of the cross of Christ and yours and mine. Notice if you keep on Highway 8, one of the good things is you'll never be on the wrong road. You're always on the right road. You're moving to the north, to the northeast, to the northwest, to the south, to the southeast, to the southwest. You're moving around not in circles, but with a carefully devised system of progress. It keeps you on the right road because you keep passing through the cross, passing through the intersection of your life. And staying on the right road 
in serving God his way, not your way. And finally, keep your eyes focused on the road. Highway 8 with Christ. It always keeps your eyes on the future. You don't go around in circles. You don't end up at a dead end street. You just keep moving around and around and around and around. Keeping your eyes on the future at each curve. Keeping your eyes on Jesus, the author, perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. And now he has the name that is above every name. That every knee shall bow and tongue confess. Jesus is the Lord. Keep your eyes moving on highway 8 with Christ. You will forever keep your eyes on your future with Jesus Christ. Who leads us today, tomorrow, next week, next month. And forever. So our prayer this day is this. Almighty God, your son willingly endured the agony and shame of the cross for our redemption. Grant us courage to take up our cross daily and follow him wherever he leads. With Jesus we pray. Amen.
Well, dear friends, uh, again, today is Sunday, August the 30th. And yesterday I received a message from my cousin that informed me that my wonderful Aunt Nancy, Auntie Nancy, has, as the song said, passed the horizon and has gone home to be with the Lord. I share about my Auntie Nancy because as a very young boy, she would take me out to the lake, and there in Michigan, she'd point out to the waters and say, now, Phil, there's something really big out there. And she raised my curiosity, increased my levels of hope, because uh, Auntie Nancy was talking to me about fish. She wanted to teach us all how to fish. And she was always on the journey of finding the very big catch. Well, I have to tell you that after many attempts, I think I've only caught a fish that's only, yay, so big from a beautiful Orr Lake of the state of Michigan. But I'm reminded of my Auntie Nancy as she now is in heaven with, uh, well, her sister, my mother, and so many others, obviously, who have... Uh, known Jesus and put their faith and their confidence in Christ, the sure foundation. And so now it's time for us to encourage each other, even at home, wherever we may be, to take the time to be the people of God, to be children, and to actually experience God's word and his presence in our household. You know, the Bible has a way of saying to us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And the same Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, so often when churches have gathered in community before the cross of Christ, they may even repeat those scripture verses. I'd like to encourage you at home to practice what Pastor John told the congregation to do. Confess your sins to one another and to confess them before God because he is faithful to forgive. So why not take the time to experience a little or a big church at home and just share with each other in God's mercy and forgive each other and even say to each other in the name of Jesus Christ, because you confess your belief that Jesus is the Savior, why not say to the family member and friend, your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Here's maybe the second question. If you really do believe that you are a child of Jesus, following Jesus throughout this life, why not take the time to think, what are some of the biggest challenges that are facing you at this time, this season, maybe even in this upcoming week? Maybe think of a cross. What cross are you uh, a little bit reluctant or maybe even fearful or you're doubtful that you could carry such? Well, with the help of Jesus, we pick up our crosses and we follow so why not share with each other at around the table or just as you're meeting with each other as church at home, what challenge is coming up? And therefore, when you identify sort of that cross that you want to pick up, have family and friends then join and gather around you and to pray and to ask God uh, to help. I've asked many of my friends to help my uh, cousin Liz and Patty at this time of uh, sadness and loss, and yet such a time of uh, bittersweet joy that my Auntie Nancy has gone to heaven. So maybe you two can think of uh, ways that you can pray for others to put their faith and their hope and confidence in the sure hope of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Hang on to hope. That's what we've been talking about here at church as well as the church at home. 
It's like we need to grab all ten of those little toes and get on the end of the surfboard and join, board and join with Jesus and go for a ride of faith. Well, remember, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And that becomes the ride even of freedom. And so as we go, as the people of God, we remember the love of Christ compels us to go in his name, preach the good news, teach the truth, heal the hurting, send me Lord. My wife is shaking her head, so before I, let me fix it. It's the love of Christ compels us to go in his name, preach the good news, heal the hurting, teach the truth, send me Lord. This last week I had the other order but you know they're all serving Jesus Christ and others by his amazing love we'll go in peace and serve the Lord and may the Lord bless you and keep you make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you may the Lord look upon you with countenance and grant you his peace amen